Hello everyone, uh, I am Anne Bertolotti. I'm a program leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge in the UK. And uh, this talk is the third of a set of talks uh, I've given on protein uh, phosphatases. And in this talk, I will uh, share with you uh, some assays that we've developed that can enable uh, the study of protein phosphatases, as well as uh, enable the uh, discovery of selective phosphatase uh, inhibitors. Uh, but before I go there, I'd like to uh, give you a bit of background to tell you how uh, we became interested in phosphatases in the first place. So my lab has been interested in misfolded proteins for many years uh, because these proteins, when they accumulate uh, in the form of insoluble aggregates, represent a huge problem uh, for cells and organisms. And, and this problem is the molecular basis of a broad range of human diseases, including uh, the devastating uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, and so on. So these are devastating diseases that affect an increasing number of individuals in our aging societies. They are very different uh, clinical uh, disorders, but at the origin, what we have is a common problem, uh, which begins when cells fail to handle these misfolded proteins that are uh, normally produced at all times. Turns out that we have mechanisms built in, self-defense mechanisms, to neutralize uh, these um, aggregation-prone proteins, and these mechanisms work really, really well for many decades of our lives. And so uh, one idea uh, we've developed in my lab is to try and boost uh, these natural defense mechanisms in order to uh, try to find treatments uh, that could uh, perhaps benefit uh, these diverse uh, neurodegenerative diseases in the long run. So today I'll, I'll show you uh, one approach uh, that we've developed that enables cells to increase their self-defense uh, capacity against misfolded proteins. So uh, a natural uh, defense mechanism against many forms of stresses consists in uh, phosphorylating a protein which is called EIF2-alpha. This is a translation initiation factor. And when EIF2-alpha is phosphorylated, uh, this results in a decrease in the rate of uh, protein synthesis because uh, EF2-alpha is a translation initiation factor, and when it's phosphorylated, it no longer uh, functions uh, properly in initiating uh, protein synthesis. So the benefit of this, the decrease in protein synthesis, is to increase the protein quality control capacity of cells because under normal circumstances, vast majority of cellular resources are engaged in, in mass protein production. And so if you decrease protein synthesis, then as a result, it spares uh, the uh, existing resources to uh, handle uh, the damage. And here, the damage uh, is about uh, misfolded protein. So this is one way this signaling event is protective. Now, the activity of the kinases that phosphorylate EF to alpha is antagonized by phosphatases. And we uh, mammals have evolved with two uh, selective EF to alpha phosphatases. These enzymes uh, belong to the family of PP1 uh, phosphatases. They have uh, uh, they are peculiar enzymes in the sense that they are split enzy enzymes. They are composed of two components that need to be brought together uh, for this enzyme uh, to function. So uh, the EF2 alpha phosphatases have a common uh, catalytic uh, subunit PP1 that they actually share with about 200 other phosphatases in the cell. But what dictates their selectivity is uh, the uh, regulatory uh, subunit, the non-catalytic subunit, so R15A. Um, is one of them, the other is R15B. These are related uh, proteins functionally, but they are uh, different, they are encoded by two different genes. And it turns out that R15A is stress-inducible, it's selectively translated when EIF12 is phosphorylated, and in this way, it comes up as a response uh, to stress to enable uh, the rapid dephosphorylation of EIF2 alpha. And R15B, uh, on the other hand, does the same job, but it's constitutively expressed uh, in all cells and all tissues, uh, as far as we can tell, to maintain low levels of EIF2 alpha phosphorylation. So we've discovered, and I've uh, discussed this in uh, the second talk of this series, uh, we've discovered small molecule uh, inhibitors of the uh, stress-inducible uh, EIF2-alpha phosphatases. 
uh, sorry, the stress-inducible EF12 phosphatase. So these inhibitors, uh, guanabans and cephin, selectively bind uh, to R15A, and as a result, they inhibit um, this phosphatase to prolong the duration of this naturally occurring uh, self-defense mechanism against misfolded uh, proteins. And to illustrate uh, how this work, works, I'm going to share with you uh, a small video that uh, actually um, summarizes uh, 10 years of work in, in about one minute. Under normal circumstances, our cells are busy making thousands of proteins required to e execute all uh, the cellular function. And this process requires uh, chaperones, these little hands in orange, that make sure proteins fold properly, that they don't aggregate. We make errors, we make mistakes, we sometimes produce bad proteins, but we are able to target them uh, to degradations. Uh, uh, here I'm showing the proteasome, which is, which is not only important in degrading proteins, but also uh, vital to recycle uh, amino acid. And this all goes well for years, for decades, up to a point as we age, we accumulate, uh, or in diseases, we accumulate these bad uh, proteins. And one way to defend ourselves against this is to phosphorylate EF12 to slow down protein synthesis. And this in turn has enabled the chaperones that are normally busy assisting the folding of newly synthesized proteins to become available to handle the misfolded ones. And this is one way uh, this uh, pathway is protective. So in this work, uh, we realized that uh, we can actually selectively inhibit a phosphatase by targeting uh, the regulatory subunit. And this was an exciting news because phosphatases were thought uh, to be undruggable, largely because uh, they share a catalytic subunit. So if you inhibit the catalytic subunit in, in the way uh, people usually classically think about uh, 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 enzyme inhibitors here. If we inhibit PP1, it's not one enzyme that we inhibit, but hundreds. And that's really not uh, useful because uh, this actually is uh, toxic and kills cells. So uh, having uh, discovered that we can inhibit one phosphatase, we realize also that perhaps we can inhibit many more uh, phosphatases using um, the same principle targeting uh, the regulatory subunits. But for that, we really needed to develop methods and assays to do so because the first uh, phosphatase inhibit selective phosphatase inhibitors we had discovered uh, were discovered through a phenotypic screen. So to move forward, we thought we absolutely need to reconstitute the function and the selectivity of these phosphatases with uh, recombinant proteins. And this was uh, challenging for many reasons, uh, but I'll only uh, summarize um, this uh, piece of work which took many years to develop uh, in my lab. But before I get there, uh, let me um, summarize for you where we were uh, when we started this work. So for many years, as I explained uh, in the first talk of this uh, series, uh, people had been working with uh, the um, uh, highly purified uh, phosphatase, which is uh, uh, the enzyme uh, removed from its uh, cellular uh, regulators, these non-catalytic subunits that normally confer selectivity to the enzyme. And as a result, uh, the phosphatase, highly purified in this way, uh, was found to be non-selective because it can dephosphorylate pretty much any substrate uh, you will uh, uh, give to it, uh, particularly in a test tube uh, when it's used at high concentration. And uh, the non-catalytic subunit of phosphatases were known, but they were largely uh, described as inhibitors of uh, PP1 because uh, when bound to PP1, they inhibit uh, the dephosphorylation in vitro in the test tube of this classical, uh, the historical substrate that was uh, that led. Um, Fish and Krebs to uh, discover uh, the role of protein uh, phosphorylation in controlling uh, the activity uh, of uh, proteins. So non-catalytic subunits of PP1 were largely uh, described as inhibitors in the literature, and our favorite at the time uh, didn't escape this. Uh, R15A was uh, reported uh, by the lab of uh, Shirishi Onalika in uh, 2001 to uh, inhibit uh, the dephosphorylation of phosphorylase A in a concentration-dependent manner. And intriguingly, uh, Shirish uh, Sinarlika's group noted that R15A, when added to a dephosphorylation reaction uh, with uh, EF2-alpha uh, phosphorylated as a substrate, did uh, nothing at all. 
So uh, we uh, started uh, recapitulating what was known. And so we started by reproducing what was uh, in the literature. So Marta Carrara, a talented uh, biochemist, uh, joined the lab, purified PP1, purified uh, R15A, R15B, uh, prepared uh, some phosphorylase A, um, uh, phosphorylated, and she found, has no surprise, right, that PP1 could uh, dephosphorylate um, the phosphorylase A, but uh, when she added uh, R15A or R15B, this completely blocked uh, the dephosphorylation. So that was fine, but remember, uh, we are interested in the dephosphorylation of EF2 alpha, not so much in the dephosphorylation of phosphorylase A. And by the way, not surprisingly, our inhibitors had no effect whatsoever in the uh, assay uh, here using uh, phosphorylase A uh, as a substrate. So we really needed to uh, develop assay where we can study dephosphorylation of EF2 alpha by its cognate. Uh, uh, hollow phosphatases, so PP1R15A, PP1R15B. So the first thing Marta did was to develop uh, the assay along the line of the classical assays the, uh, uh, that had been uh, used in the field using phosphorylase A uh, as a substrate, but here she replaced it with EF2 alpha, and in the same condition, uh, uh, what she observed was indeed uh, PP1 could uh, dephosphorylate um, EF2 alpha, but when she added the uh, non-catalytic subunit R15A and R15B, she saw nothing at all. Nothing happened. And here, I can't list all the possible reasons why an assay like this might fail. The proteins we produce may not be uh, active, and we know that uh, these proteins are thought to be natively unstructured, so maybe they are not uh, functional. But there could be a million of reasons the assay is not performed in the right condition where to begin, we didn't quite know. So we went back to our uh, computers and, and read uh, the literature again thoroughly. And here we realized that actually uh, the concentration of PP1 in the cell is estimated to be 0.2 uh, micromolar. So knowing that PP1 is uh, uh, not uh, present in isolation in the cell, but is, is a subunit of more than 200 uh, protein complexes, then we did a simple uh, mathematical calculation and realized that any given oloenzyme had to be active in a cell at a nanomolar concentration. So then we did something uh, 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 very uh, trivial. Uh, we titrated uh, PP1 and looked at uh, its ability to dephosphorylate uh, EF2 alpha. And sure enough, uh, the less you add, the less activities. And we realized that at 10 nanomolar, with this preparation of PP1, uh, from 10, uh, 30 nanomolar uh, and below, uh, there was no dephosphorylation of EIF2 alpha. I must stress that uh, for those of you who want to uh, follow these assays, it is really important to titrate every uh, preparation of PP1. Uh, consistently with this procedure, uh, we found that uh, below 30 nanomolar, nanomolar PP1 is no longer active, but since that, we've improved the purification of PP1 uh, further, and we now uh, work with our, uh, in, our, in our assays with one nanomolar of PP1. So it's important to do this titration uh, with any uh, preparation of uh, PP1. So here we use uh, the same assay as I've shown you before, uh, but we use much less PP1, and with one micromolar of substrate and 10 nanomolar of PP1, we see PP1 does not uh, dephosphorylate uh, EF2 alpha, but here, when we add the uh, non-catalytic subunit, bingo. We found that this converted this otherwise inactive PP1 in this assay condition into a very active enzyme. And we find the very same uh, with R15B. And this was very, very exciting for us because this provided us with an assay biochemically defined with a small number of components, the catalytic subunit, the non-catalytic subunit, and the substrate. And this assay recapitulated not only the function, so our EF2 alpha holophosphatases were able to dephosphorylate their cognate substrate EF2 alpha, but importantly also, this assay recapitulated the selectivity of holophosphatases because the EF2 alpha uh, phosphatases, R15A PP1 and R15B PP1, were unable to dephosphorylate uh, the phosphorylase A. 
So that was really exciting because for the first time we had an assay, a simple biochemical assay that enabled us to study the function at the molecular level of these uh, non-catalytic subunits that we had known for more than 20 years that were important to help the dephosphorylation of EF2-alpha. We began, again, by uh, looking at what was known, and it was known from many, many groups that I can't uh, all cite here, that uh, the uh, carboxy terminal region of R15A and R15B contains a binding site to PP1 and is important uh, to recruit uh, PP1. But that uh, is not sufficient uh, to reconstitute a functional holophosphatase. To make a functional holophosphatase, one needs, in addition to the carboxy terminal region of the R15 proteins that bind, P bind PP1, we need a large fraction of, uh, a large fragment of the amino terminal region of R15. And I'll tell you why uh, this region is important. We found, or rather Marta found, uh, that the amino terminal region of uh, R15B, as well as R15A, serves as a really high affinity uh, binding site for the substrate EF to alpha. And this is where selectivity is encoded. If we take a non-related, uh, uh, non-catalytic subunit, uh, we find no binding at all uh, to uh, the substrate EF to alpha. So uh, from this, uh, we've proposed that uh, the non-catalytic subunits of phosphatases, particularly these, uh, are uh, modular uh, proteins. They contain a binding site to PP1, and they, which is important to recruit the catalytic subunit, but also uh, they contain a binding site for the substrate. And this is um, important uh, to, uh, for the holophosphatase uh, to uh, function. And this led me to uh, propose that actually phosphatases are split enzymes. They are composed of two uh, modules that absolutely need to be together in the cell for the phosphatase to work. The catalytic subunit is there and is important to cleave uh, the phosphate of uh, proteins, but this action only occurs if uh, a non-catalytic subunit has brought the substrate uh, for the catalytic subunit to dephosphorylate uh, this uh, substrate. And so, uh, from that, I think, uh, knowing that we have 200, uh, or perhaps even more, holophosphatases in the cell, this brings the notion that we have actually a split protein phosphatase system. And I'd like to think about it as a sort of key lock system where only the right key can open the right lock. And only the uh, right, the cognate uh, regulatory, uh, uh, formerly called regulatory subunit that I'd like now to call substrate receptor, only the cognate substrate receptor brings uh, the cognate substrate to uh, PP1 to enable uh, productive dephosphorylation. And this simple model actually uh, explains a, a very old uh, conundrum in phosphatase biology, which is how these non-catalytic subunits, remember, initially were described as inhibitors of phosphorylase A dephosphorylation. And obviously, we didn't evolve 200 enzymes, 200 proteins, sorry, to block the dephosphorylation of phosphorylase A. Uh, these non-catalytic subunit of phosphatases, on one hand, uh, serves as a high affinity uh, receptor for uh, the substrate, but in this way also uh, prevents PP1 from a non-selective uh, dephosphorylation. So a dual uh, function uh, in this way. So with the knowledge we had acquired, we could then go back to our uh, initial question, which was uh, trying to understand how these small molecule inhibitors, guanabas and cephin, that we had uh, discovered, uh, selectively uh, inhibited uh, R15A. And I'm going to summarize uh, our findings for you. We found that these inhibitors uh, bind uh, specifically to a region in the amino terminal uh, part of R15A. And following binding, they induce a conformational change, which then uh, uh, perturb the substrate uh, recruiting activity of R15A. And this is how these small molecules uh, prevent dephosphorylation um, of uh, EF to alpha. So this was a, a, a summary of, of many, many years of work. So here, for starting from our interest in protein misfolding, we discovered a protein that we can selectively inhibit, R15A. It's a non-catalytic subunit of a phosphatase. And I've shown you in talk number two the benefit 
of this uh, selective inhibition of R15A uh, to improve uh, rare disease caused by uh, accumulation of misfolded proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, and the disease is called uh, Charcomaritus 1b. So this is exciting, uh, but if you remember uh, my first slide, I mentioned a broad range of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ELS, Huntington's, and so on. And I've often been asked after uh, our discoveries on guanavans and cephin, do you think you can treat all these diseases with this inhibitor? Well, disappointingly, the answer to that question, question came uh, very rapidly, and the answer is no, because simply, uh, in these diseases, uh, we don't think uh, that R15A is expressed. And this is because R15A is inducible uh, by a subset of, condi of conditions, particularly conditions uh, 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 causing uh, accumulation of misfolded proteins in the endoplasmic uh, reticulum. This is not the case in these other diseases, and sort of stating the obvious, if R15A is not expressed, then R15A inhibitors are not going to be of much use uh, in this context. So that led us to become interested in the functionally related uh, protein, uh, R15B, and the idea was simple. R15B is expressed everywhere, so perhaps uh, we could achieve the same uh, benefit that I've explained at the beginning of, of this talk, reduction of protein synthesis to increase protein quality control capacity by uh, targeting R15B, alleviating the limitation of R15A, which is uh, the, the fact that R15B 15A is only expressed in a small subset of diseases. So that was our, our next uh, idea. And the issue uh, was, well, we still didn't have any assay uh, to enable rational discovery of selective phosphatase inhibitors. So Anna Sigurda Dottier, a talented uh, uh, postdoc, joined my lab to develop a screening method with the recombinant and functional uh, holoenzymes that we had um, characterized uh, before. So what Anna did was she reconstituted these functional enzymes on a chip that we then used uh, for surface plasmon resonance uh, measurements. So this is a method that enables uh, the measurement of uh, binding of uh, uh, molecules uh, to each other. So of course the first thing we wanted to know is whether this method was good enough to detect the binding of the known um, inhibitors of R15A. And this actually worked uh, remarkably well. Uh, Anna found that um, guanabins bind uh, uh, selectively uh, to R15A uh, PP1, and it does so uh, with a sub-micromolar affinity, which is uh, compatible with the potency of the compound we had observed uh, in cells. And guanabins, as we had seen uh, through many other cell-based assay before, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't affect the related phosphatase R15B uh, PP1. So that gave us confidence that the assay was uh, uh, relevant, and so we went on and characterized cephin uh, in the assay say, and interestingly, we also found that cephin is selectively uh, uh, binding to uh, R15A PP1 with uh, uh, an affinity that is 30 times higher than uh, for R15B uh, PP1. So all this gave us uh, much confidence that the assay uh, was relevant and we could use it to discover uh, new inhibitors. So there was something interesting here, uh, which uh, came from the observation that by uh, making uh, cephin this derivative of guanabins, we actually created a low affinity binding site for the compound to R15B uh, PP1. And that led us to suspect that perhaps in the same a chemical space as guanabins and cephin, we could perhaps uh, identify uh, some small molecule inhibitors that could uh, selectively uh, inhibit uh, R15B. So following this, uh, I then uh, designed a small uh, uh, library of molecules, and Anna used those uh, in a screen for binders to uh, R15B uh, PP1, and she counter-screened on uh, the related phosphatase 
R15 a PP1, and we also can't screen on PP1 because we don't want at all to inhibit PP1. Remember, that's not selective at all. So she identified in this way a number of tight binders uh, to R15 B PP1, and I'm going to discuss uh, during the rest of this talk a molecule that we call raffine. Raffine stands for rationally discovered phosphatase inhibitor because this is the first uh, time we've been able to rationally identify a selective inhibitor of a phosphatase here targeting. R15B. So, uh, raffine binds uh, selectively to uh, R15B, and following binding, it actually uh, uh, alters the conformation of um, R15B, and this prevents substrate recruitment and inhibits the enzyme in the in vitro assay that I've described earlier. Interestingly, when this happens in cells, so raffine can enter cells and inhibits uh, R15B in cells as well, but following the binding of raffine to R15B in cells, the conformation of R15B is altered, as we had seen in vitro, but this in cells is recognized by a protein quality control system in such a way that R15B bound to raffine in this altered conformation is then targeted to the degradation machinery by a process that involves a chaperone, uh, P97, uh, which is uh, important in recognizing this abnormal uh, conformation of R15B. So, in this way, raffine... Um, uh, by inhib inhibits R15B and target it to uh, degradation. The consequence of this is to uh, increase uh, the phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha in cells, and this leads to uh, attenuation of protein synthesis. That was anticipated. But uh, interestingly, this attenuation of protein synthesis is actually uh, transient. And this is because when EIF2 alpha is phosphorylated, this also leads to a selective translation of R15A, which then comes up to dephosphorylate EF2 alpha. So inhibition of R15B leads to a transient phosphorylation of EF2 alpha. And again, this is because the compound is selective. And actually, when we add a uh, R15A inhibitor together with uh, the R15B inhibitor, we uh, convert this transient attenuation of protein synthesis into a persistent one because we inhibit uh, this negative uh, feedback loop involving uh, R15A. So that was quite exciting. We thought here we have a wonderful way to uh, 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 presumably safely increase protein uh, quality control capacity, safely because the attenuation of protein synthesis is, is uh, transient. And we want to use that to uh, see whether we can ameliorate diverse diseases associated with the misfolding pro of, of proteins, and particularly uh, diseases where R15A uh, is not expressed. So, uh, first, let me tell you that uh, raffine has suitable properties for uh, in vivo studies. Uh, it's orally available, it crosses the blood brain barrier, and we've uh, performed uh, tolerability studies and found that even at high doses, uh, the compound is actually safe. And we think the safety uh, comes with the fact that we have this negative feedback loop involving R15A, which prevents. Uh, phosphorylation uh, from being uh, uh, excessive, uh, phosphorylation of the EIF2 alpha from, from being excessive. So, in this way, uh, we, the system is safeguarded against an excessive uh, phosphorylation of EIF2 uh, alpha. So, uh, in uh, pilot studies, we've uh, started uh, uh, treating uh, models, uh, mouse models of Huntington's. Uh, disease because uh, we didn't find uh, R15A uh, in, 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 the, in these uh, mice, and therefore R15A is not a, a target uh, for this. So we treated uh, mice um, expressing mutant Huntington, and these mice, uh, as is the case in the human disease, uh, fail uh, to gain weight. Uh, over time, so weight loss is a prominent uh, characteristic of, of Huntington's disease. And you can see that this is neutralized with treatment uh, with raffine. And interestingly, this comes about because uh, raffine uh, decreases uh, the accumulation of 
the Huntington inclusions uh, that cause uh, the disease. And we can see that by many uh, different approaches. Uh, biochemically, we look at these aggregates running uh, uh, gels, as shown here. Uh, but we can also uh, see uh, the same uh, benefit by looking at inclusions by immunohistostaining and quantify this in a double-blind way. You can see uh, the effect of the compound is extremely uh, robust, considering the fact that this uh, model is a very aggressive model of Huntington's disease. So this is very exciting. And uh, all in all, uh, this uh, work really highlights the beauty, the power, and the benefit of inhibiting uh, phosphatase by targeting uh, the regulatory subunit here. I've shown you uh, two examples. We've identified two targets that are functionally related, R15A and R15B. We can inhibit uh, selectively one or the other uh, to increase protein uh, quality control capacity uh, in cells, and this translates at least in mice, in uh, therapeutic uh, benefit. R15A inhibition, we think, is useful for diseases where the misfolding pathology uh, is in the endoplasmic uh, reticulum, whilst R15B uh, inhibition uh, will be uh, useful for diseases where the accumulation of misfolded proteins occurs in the cytosol or in the nucleus, and that's the case for the common neurodegenerative diseases. I've shown you an example for Huntington's, but uh, we are uh, thinking that this might be applicable to other uh, protein misfolding diseases as well. So in the background of this, we've created a platform to enable uh, the rational discovery of selective phosphatase inhibitors, the platform that I've uh, introduced to you, uh, starting with the biophysical uh, screen that Anna has developed, can be used with any phosphatase, with a positive screen to identify selective binders to a given phosphatase, and a counter screen with an unrelated uh, phosphatase, as well as an isolated uh, catalytic subunit. And then we follow up with a cell-based assay, where we measure uh, un target engagement uh, in cells, and we also filter off-target compounds by testing the effect of the compound in cells knocked out uh, for the target. And we can also look at the mechanism of action of uh, these inhibitors using uh, the in vitro assay uh, that I've uh, shown you. So I think it's fair to say that phosphatases are no longer undruggable. I've reported to you how we discovered that we can selectively uh, inhibit a phosphatase, and this discovery came up through a phenotypic screen. But following that, we uh, were motivated to study phosphatase function, and we developed a series of assays that then enabled us not only to understand the function of phosphatases and how their selectivity is encoded, but also to design assays that we can use now to selectively uh, inhibit uh, diverse uh, phosphatases. And that's exciting for many reasons. Uh, these phosphatase inhibitors will uh, become tools uh, to study uh, phosphatase biology, and that's uh, very much uh, needed. But there's also uh, something very interesting uh, that I'd like to bring uh, to uh, your uh, attention. I think that phosphatase uh, inhibition may represent a really attractive new uh, therapeutic modality for the following reasons. Uh, as you may know, many signaling pathways operate on the, the same uh, principle with a kinase in the activation phase of a signaling uh, event followed by a phosphatase uh, uh, involved in terminating uh, this signaling event. And I've shown you in two examples that, that by inhibiting a phosphatase, we prolong the duration of a naturally occurring uh, signaling event. And in this way, I think we might uh, be able to deliver new and safer medicines that uh, will enhance our self-defense uh, mechanism. So that's an attractive uh, possibility for the, for the future, but certainly we've brought here assays uh, that enable not only to study phosphatases, but also uh, to come up with uh, selective uh, inhibitors. And I will close uh, here on this uh, speculative note and, and, and contemplating the future of phosphatase research, but also uh, acknowledging all the fantastic people uh, that have joined my lab and embarked on really challenging uh, pieces of work and uh, joined me in, in, in doing what we do in my lab, which is studying the unknown. And that's always been great fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>